Hey guys, I'm Phoenix Gray, and welcome to Lit RPG Happy Hour, where I sample Lit RPG and alcoholic beverages. Feel free to drink along if you dare. Today, uh, I'll be reading a sample of Beginner's Luck, Character Development Book 1 by Aaron J. And I'll be drinking, a, uh, I will be playing a game uh, along with it called Hey You, where I will take a drink uh, anytime another character says the main character's name. If you want to follow along, pause this video and download a copy of the book sample at the link provided. Or you can just take a drink whenever I do. As a disclaimer, I do not read uh, every book that I drink to. This is all for fun and to help spread the word about Lit RPG and these awesome books. Having said that, let's get started. So today I'm going to be drinking a 155 Belmont. Uh, the recipe to it is going to be um, in the, uh, the video description. It's basically a mix of uh, orange juice, um, dark rum, light rum, and vodka. And uh, I'm expecting it to taste absolutely horrible. As you can see behind me, I finally did move. Uh, hopefully, as these videos progress, there will be less boxes or maybe eventually just no boxes, which would be awesome. Uh, right now in my office, it's a little bit of a catch-all. But uh, anyway, let me go ahead and get started. So, chapter one. I wanted to rush, but once again Jude was winning the battle of wills between us. We were smuggling ten measures of nano bribe a GM Jude. Okay, let me start that over. We were smuggling ten measures of nano to bribe a GM Jude had heard was open to some black market trading. The precious stuff moved oddly in an old container in my backpack. It was heavier somehow than its exactly measured weight and moved against all logic of momentum and cohesion. It felt like anyone watching us would know I was carrying my life savings in nano by how my backpack shifted, pushing me forward like a hand shoving on the small of my back. My best friend had the patience of a saint or the maddening calm of the devil when he knows you can only squirm in his grasp. If I spoke to him, I'd break the silence truce between us. He would take it as an opportunity to try and talk me out of this again. His ascetic features, sallow instead of pale like mine, looked calm as if today wasn't roll-up, the day our permanent characters were created. Sorry, I'm adjusting my uh, volume settings real quick so I think it was a little low. Uh, my, features were sharply drawn as, my features were sharply drawn as his, but he came by his naturally. Mine were all due to lifestyle or lack thereof. I knew what he saw when he looked at me out of the corner of his eye. A hard diet and hard life for years had parred me down to a solid core and pared me down to a solid core. My hair was a buzz cut. Any extra biomass, even for my hair, given over to saving and generating nano. We walked along over the broken pavement from one distant pool of illumination to the next as we passed under mostly dark and broken street lamps. The light poles were often completely missing their tops, let alone working LEDs or wiring. My eyes would just become a acclim acclimatized to the dark when we would hit the next patch of light. No one else was out walking these streets, much less driving a vehicle. No one went places more anymore, and certainly not along the route we were taking to an obscure public pod station near the edge of the safe zone. Agoraphobia was now a survival trait. I didn't have it, but still, walking along abandoned streets, intermittently night blind, carrying a bribe, was getting to me. Can you walk a little faster? I said, breaking down. Miles, this is a stupid idea. Cheaters never prosper, Jude calmly lectured. All right, let's give this a try. Oh god, why didn't I get a chaser? Oh, that's so bad. Okay. Uh, patronizing bastard, I thought for the millionth time in our friendship. Yet he was usually right, but not this time. This isn't cheating. I am not looking for an unfair advantage. I just want a fair shot. This isn't the way to get it. You could have joined the party youth, Jude offered. But we both knew I couldn't have. They wouldn't have let me. I wouldn't have passed the political vetting. Not with my family background. Not with my attitude. And even if they would have let me in, I couldn't have done it anyway. It would have finished breaking my father. Jude knew it too, but he wouldn't admit how the game was rigged for members of the party. We had been friends since our early days at the academy. Miss Crowling assigned us to play and write a report on tunnels and trolls and history of games. Somehow we just clicked as friends, and our play styles always meshed. He was cool and deliberate. My focus wasn't as good, but I often had a flash of insight that let us win. Despite all the baggage that my name came with, he stood by me. I loved him like a brother, but like anyone I thought of as family, things weren't simple or easy. His love life was causing me grief. Shouldn't it be my love life that caused me grief? A little late for us to debate that all again. Anyway, you didn't have to do yours with me. You could have a real role at party with your family and Maya and everyone else. I am pointing out that there is a way to get a fair shot, Jude calmly stated. 
Not for me, and it isn't a fair shot for anyone anyway if you have to join the party to get it. You sound like your father. That ended our conversation. I'd be damned if I'd started again. The public pod station was in a building of red brick and pitted mortar next to what must once have been a park. The grass had, of course, long since been scavenged under the few randomly surviving lights. There were even some pits dug randomly across the park where someone had tried to get biomass from the soil itself. We tried the door, which should have been open but was locked. Jude looked at me to see if this minor obstacle would somehow make me change my mind. I knocked quietly at first, but when that didn't elicit any response from inside, I gave it some loud bangs. Muffled noises and a voice from inside let me know someone had heard us. Your horses was half the sentence I could make out as the door swung open. Public pods are supposed to be open at all times, said Jude. The man standing in the doorway was dressed in GM colors, black and white, laid out in stripes. He actually had a little bit of a belly, which was astounding given the nature of pods, the game and nano, and of course our starving world. I was relieved to see that gut, as it was proof that the rumors Jade had heard were true. No GM at such an out-of-the-way post could possibly be successful enough to afford wasting edible calories like that without black market resources. The door sticks. It was open. Who are you anyway? The man said, hardly bothering to sell the lie about the door. We are here to roll up, I said. Are you scheduled? Yes, we signed this location up as a backup possibility. Ugh, sorry, my sinuses are killing me this week. Big gut mo motioned us inside. There was a sour smell to the air. So, no friends and family here for the big day? He asked with a knowing smirk. I thought of my father and what he would say about the ceremony that surrounded roll up. Amazing how they get people to celebrate the ending of any meaningful life. Like training cows to cheer each other on as they enter the slaughterhouse. I shook myself. I wasn't going to let my father decide things for me any more than I would the party. No one but us, Jade answered for us. I could swear he knew exactly what I was thinking. Well, I'm not that complicated, and he'd known me since I was seven. I looked around. The GM Center had once been some sort of community center connected to the park from back when we had communities in the real world that could use some centering. The GM had a name tag that read Gutmacher. Truth in advertising. We followed him to an office with a truly astounding number of meal inserts stacked along the wall. I don't think I had ever seen that many calories in one place in my life. He looked at a chunky government tablet abandoned on the corner of the empty desk. Here you are, Miles Boone and Jude Sandoval. Oh, I may have to pause this to go get a chaser. That's really bad. How do we do this, Mr. Gutmacher? I asked. We only have the one primary pod here. Both of you guys know what kind of build you are looking to roll. Of course, said Jude. All right, then you guys decide which of you will go first, Gutmacher said. I looked at Jude, but I knew he wasn't going to help me out with this. If I wanted to try this, I was going to have to take the plunge first. That is a lot of meal packs, I said. Yeah, we are a public pod center. Have to have some for sale, don't we? Gutmacher said, giving away nothing. Want to buy some? The problem with black markets and illegal trade is that there's no contract enforcement. You used to buy something legally at a store, and if they didn't deliver what they promised, the courts and police and whatnot would make them. If you didn't pay for what you bought, you'd go to jail. There is none of that for a black market exchange. People don't live up to their end of a deal. You have to enforce things on your own somehow. My dad would have said that this is where most of the violence of illegal organized crime came from. A loan shark can't take you to court or garnish your wages, so he breaks enough legs to get people to pay. Doing all your own contract enforcement turns out to be expensive and inefficient. Black market goods and services are expensive because being your own cops in court and bank is expensive. One thing our society had in spades in contract enforcement. Sorry, one thing our society had in spades is contract enforcement. But it all connected back to the game. Same with cops and lawyers and banks. Same with jails. It all relied on the game. Our food came from the game. With just some words to the game system, people could make a contract enforced with all the power of AI, the game, and, not, and nano. No one could break a contract, no matter how minor, unless they were willing to starve to death to escape it. And even then, they'd probably get forced into a pod. Conversely, in a society where the game mechanics made sure everyone kept their word, there was no way to have any trust outside of the system. We didn't have a court system anymore, or lawyers. The closest thing to cops we had now were GMs. Real life was all black market. Inside the game, we had no control over anything. Slaves to the game, as my dad would say. Only the game mechanics kept us honest. And so outside the game, we had no trust. I believe my dad. Not really because of his philo uh, philo philosophizing, but because I knew that good, un upstanding player citizens could be at least as ruthless, vicious, and aggressive as any black market hustler I read about in the histories. 
It wasn't scruples that kept them from breaking limbs, or worse like a hard case criminal. It was the fact that they could turf out their leg-breaking enforcement to the game, or do it themselves inside the game if they just wanted simple payback. PvP meant that corporal punishment had made a comeback. It was usually like that with the things my father told me. If you took out all the big words and explanations, he often just explained why history usually amounted to different examples of a boot stomping on a face. He was a grim and jaded bastard for such a huge idealist. Well, I don't know about buying meal inserts, but I could be interested in buying something else. For my roll-up, I said. What do you mean, said Gutmacher. Your pod can give party members options on roll-up. Sure. You a member of the party? He laughed. You got a guild badge? No, but I heard that there are other ways, I said. Gutmacher looked us over and sighed. You aren't carrying anywhere close to the number of meal in or in inserts you'd need to get me to do something as illegal as that. I nodded and took off my backpack, reaching in slowly withdrew the nano. Gutmacher swallowed. That bottle represented years of painstaking, scrimping, and saving. Years of never eating more or better than I had to. Years of never using my pod just for fun. Shaving my basic nano income as a minor to the bone and sometimes beyond for years. All of it to get my shot at escaping a lifetime of grinding in the beginner's area. Here, I'm just looking to get a fair shot to get out of the beginner's area. Do we have a deal? Nano behaved so oddly. It didn't wobble or bounce at all when I dropped the bottle down onto his desk. It just stuck like it was metal and the desk was a powerful magnet. Did you steal this? Kill someone? He asked with a calculating look. He wasn't asking because he cared what crimes I might have done, but because he was worrying about what kind of problems came along with this nano. Nope, this is all mine. Seven years of saving. Seven years. He looked me in the eyes and must have been must have seen something because he reached for the bottle. I put my hand on it first. What? What do I get for this? I asked. If that is all nano, you can get the full member's package. Everything up till a guild leader's air package. I can't do that without a real leader's air badge, but the package is great. Low penalties on transferring stats between abilities, top range on random outcomes on bonuses, a gear package designed to help with whatever beginner's quest you draw, and gold, two bonus skills, and of course your luck modifier will be at least two standard deviations higher than the norm. Get Matra rattled off in salesman mode. I took my hand off the bottle. This was what I had been suffering for for years. My shot. Gut Matra reached for the bottle again. This time Jude stopped him. He looked at me. Miles, you don't have to do this. We can be a team like always, he pleaded. Jude, what kind of team can can we be if I'm stuck in the beginner's area? Oh, man. You can contract under me. You grind for me, and I'll strive for the both of us. You know I can do well enough to get you out of the beginner's area in half the time, and you know I treat you well. You'd have it as good as can be in the crib. Gutmacher held his breath, worrying that he was going to lose his prize. He had nothing to worry about. So I grind for 30 years instead of 60. This is so much better. We can do it together. And if I'm stuck in the area, what about in real life, huh? You know what the discount is on loot from the crib to get things in real life. 30 years of living on basic nano and minimum meal inserts? I've done that for seven years. No. Jude took his hand off the bottle and sighed. This time Gutmacher was slower to take the bottle in his greedy hands, worrying that there would be some other last-minute snafu. You're not buying the same? Gutmacher asked Jude. No, don't need to buy it, he said and pulled out his party youth badge. Gutmacher grunted and led us to the pods. I was on my way. Chapter 2 The pods were set up in what had once been a gymnasium. There were three of the devices laid out in an isosceles, isosceles triangle. The incongruent end was a primary pod with a full controller station to the side of the transparent lid. The GM logged into the controller station, allowing the station to confirm his identity and authority via a tiny thread of nano that snaked into his tear duct as he put his head on a chin rest set to his height. Gutmacher 845321-IOTA-X-RAY, here as Game Master of Record for the permanent roll-up of Miles Boone according to all relevant local, state, and federal regulations and laws pertaining thereto and in line with holding case Meyer v. Civilization. The GM nodded for me to get in the pod. Oh, so bad. I dropped my backpack and stepped into the pod. My clothes dissolved away as I lay down on my back, leaving me naked, coated from the neck down in the silver of full-purpose nano. Encased in nano, one could see that years of want had left me rangy and, wire rangy and wiry. This is a little more invasive and uncomfortable than a usual transition, Gutmacher said by rote. 
The nano crept up over my face. Usually the process is fast enough to be over before you realize that something other than air is being forced into your ear, nose, and mouth. This time the nano was more like a syrup, and it felt like I was going to drown or choke, but the nano wouldn't let me struggle. It clamped down like steel over me. I forced myself to relax as it slipped into my nose and down my throat and into my ears. I knew it was coming towards my eyes. This was it. Seven years of sacrifice was going to pay off, and it felt like being buried alive. Exemption from usual protocol authorized. Guild badge, non-responsive, but confirmed under the authority of Exemption 7843321, logged this date. I heard Gut Mantra command to get the primary pod to allow me access to party options. I knew it! I knew it! said a voice I knew, and my stomach dropped. My eyes shifted to Jude. He looked more resigned than anything else, and in that moment, I knew I was screwed. Of course, Miles Boone is a cheater. Nothing but a dirty cheater. Jude, I can't believe you let yourself get dragged into this with Boone, said Maya Eastman. Oh, that little bit of orange juice in there is not helping it at all. Stuck in the pod with only a view of Gutmacher at the control station and Jude beside him, I couldn't see her, but I didn't need to. I knew exactly what she looked like. Long auburn hair, features that should have been beautiful but were too clenched and angry to live up to their potential. Heir to the Eastman clan branch of the party and Jude's girlfriend. Her guild badge would be prominently displayed as a bracelet, brooch, or necklace. She should have just made it into a tiara so everyone know would know she was guild royalty. I tried to speak but couldn't with Nano lodged in my mouth. Only a muffled groan escaped. I have no idea what I would have said at that moment anyway. Only Nano could have held me in place. I was so angry. Mere steel would surely have melted and bent as years of frustration and sacrifice were about to be destroyed. Maya was a party fanatic. She may have been a privileged heir, but she was also a true believer in the game system. A scion of a feudal clan didn't see her advantages as a proof of how corrupt the system was. She understood her position as a reward for her and her family's service as the tools to fulfill her duty. I heard my father's voice in my ears. You'd be surprised how impossible it is to teach someone something with, when their self-regard depends on not learning it. If someone's wealth or position depends on not seeing something, they won't be able to see even an elephant in front of them. If she wasn't so sure of the truth and goodness of her cause, I might have had a chance. I could bribe or plead, but Maya wouldn't. No, couldn't bend. She likely even thought that turning me in would be for my own good. I think half the reason she was dating Jude was to prove that she was a decent person and that the system worked. She was willing to date some regular boy who just made it into the party youth from the mass of us nobodies. A blowjob out of noblesse uh, oblige is still a blowjob. I maniacally wanted to tell Jude as my mind spun from dying hopes and lack of oxygen due to a stalled transition. As uh, at some unseen gesture, Gutmacher unfroze, making some adjustment at the controller, causing the nano to recede from my face and mouth. I sucked in the air as much as I could with my chest still encased in unyielding nano. I could strain my neck and see Maya flanked by a few party associates. Jude is innocent. He's been trying to talk. He has been trying to talk me out of this all along the way. I gasped. Maybe I could save one of us. She shot Jude a look. He gave a shrug that could be taken in a number of ways. She stared at him, trying to see into his heart. I knew how frustrating trying to read Jude could be. Inscru uh, inscrutable doesn't cover it. Player Eastman, I think you have the wrong impression here, Gutmacher began. Shut up, you corrupt little you corrupt little toad, or things will go even harder for you, Maya grated. Gutmacher immediately shut up, his mouth closing with an audible clop. He stood there eyeing her, waiting to find out what Maya Eastman was going to do. We all waited to see what Maya was going to do. That is when I realized something. Maya had no GMs accompanying her. She also didn't have anyone, but had no one with her except for subordinates she could control with her either. Why didn't she? She should have been leading a troop of GMs, and as many peers or superiors she could get to come with her to see her thwarting actual black market tearing in a corrupt GM. Destroying my father's son would be a real feather in her cap. Why not? Where are the GMs and her audience? I needed to stall her while I figured this out. The tinier, f the tiniest flicker of hope kindled in my heart. How did you know about Gutmacher? I can't believe Jude told you, I asked. Jude snorted. I turned to him. I didn't tell her about Gutmacher. She told me about him, Miles, you idiot. You know I didn't have any black market connections. Where did you think I would hear about high-level suspicions of a GM? He said, oh, I said. My hissed in frustration. When he didn't invite me to his roll-up, I became concerned and figured you must have gotten into something. 
Why didn't you just ask your father for a black market connection? You must have gotten your nano from him. Why drag Jude into your cheating? Why get him into this? And with that, I knew why there were no GMs, why there were no peers, no one else from the party. She hadn't told anyone yet. She didn't want to ruin Jude. She didn't want to destroy her boyfriend. That was almost human. That means that I might have a chance. She didn't want to do this. Consciously or subconsciously, she had left herself an out. If she had GMs and all the rest, she would have to follow through on this. She had left herself at least the possibility of an out if she could find a way to do so. An out for her was an out for Jude, and, just maybe, an out for me. What did I know? I knew Maya didn't want to destroy Jude. I knew she'd take great pleasure in destroying me. She was incapable of turning a blind eye to anyone who upset the game and the party. Dissenters were enemies. She had a missionary zeal. When Jude first introduced us, she tried to recruit me into party activities. When I refused to join her clan's social program, she was confused. When I showed no interest in trying to become any clan's junior associate or working my way into the party, she was mystified and upset. She wouldn't let it go, and eventually I told her what I thought of the game as the party played it, which just about gave her a stroke. Only an idiot or my father's son would tell a clan heir that the party are a bunch of corporate assholes. Then she found out who my father was, and she might as well have found out that I was the son of Satan himself. She tried to get Jude to abandon our friendship. I always loved the guy for refusing. Unlike a lot of the other party members I had run-ins with growing up, she didn't use her connections or hangers on to bully me. She was constrained by her own convictions, her own sense that the game was the fairest and best tool to order society and keep it safe. Didn't let her use her connections to intimidate me. That would make her the villain, but she saw herself as a paladin of humanity. Instead, she lectured and preached. We couldn't be in the same room without her reflexively talking up the benefits that the party had brought to society. She had to make us see how good and noble her clan and the party system was. She just couldn't stand the idea of people disagreeing. Because I didn't see it her way, she hated me. Or maybe she feared me. Like, my ideas might be contagious. She had been raised to believe that she was saving the world, and someone like me was standing in her way. The fact that I kept rubbing her face in the power, prestige and privilege her family and the party took in return for their world-saving efforts maddened her. The idea that the party and its perks were endangering humanity was blasphemy. Maya was a true believer. Without me being the fly in her ointment, she'd happily be dating Jude, living a life of wealth and status while being able to congratulate herself for literally saving the world. Now I might take in Jude away, too. She needed to smite me and save Jude. These two goals were impossible to square. If she let Jude or me off the hook, she betrayed the party in which she had unshaken faith. Unshakable faith. She couldn't do that. She enforced the rules of the game. Jude would never get out of the beginner's area, or worse. Thinking about this, I realized that whatever she felt for Jude, she wouldn't delay much longer. Her very faith in the game would convince her that Jude would get a decent outcome from the system. Thinking even more, I realized that Jude probably would, especially if she got her family to put their thumbs on the scales to give him a deal. Maya wouldn't even see the, uh, that as corruption since it was all for a good cause. And, by definition, whatever she wanted was a good cause. I was happy for my friend. From either Maya or my point of view, for, from either Maya's or my point of view, he didn't deserve any punishment. He wasn't against the party, and I didn't want him to suffer on my account. I was on my own. My mind raced to figure out a way out of this. What could I do to get a fanatic to go easy on a blaspheming heretic like myself? What would she want more than to smite an unbeliever like myself? What does a true believer want more than to strike out at someone attacking those beliefs? It didn't seem like there could be anything. Maya lived to advance her cause. And with that, I saw it. I saw my path out of this. I knew what a zealot wants more than to destroy those who lack faith. My father isn't a criminal. Which you know. If you could have prosecuted him for something, you and yours would have long ago. It turns out that when I needed to find a black market to buy what should have been mine by right, the best way to find corruption was to ask one of the families who control the party. I did my best to imitate Jude's patronizing patience. I knew how maddening it could be. Good try, but we have the nano. You and your father are going to answer for that, she retorted. Nope, the nano is mine. You can ask Jude. She looked to Jude, who minutely nodded his head yes. She thought for a minute and then shook her head in disbelief. How would he know anyway? You said he was innocent of all this. There is no legal way you could have gotten that nano. You aren't in the game yet. You couldn't have earned it, and we know you couldn't have gotten it from your father, as he so famously refused to play the game. You have nothing. I didn't have to put on an act to respond with anger and contempt. The nano was seven years of my life, Maya. Seven years of using no nano. When I had a cut, I healed the old-fashioned way. I've had the flu. I broke my arm four years ago. I got better eventually. I eat nothing but meal inserts. Have you ever seen me wear anything other than basic grays? Ever seen me with anything that takes excess nano ever? 
Didn't you ever wonder why I never joined you guys for any of your virtual outings? Why I never had any upgraded equipment at school? I've lived like a monk for seven years to save up enough nano to buy myself the chance at a character that you and yours get handed to you. You can check the logs on my pod. Seven years of eating great paste. Her face paled at the idea of someone accomplishing what I had. If you join the party, you can get a better roll-up, she said. Look at Jude. I laughed in her face. You know what it takes to join the party? I'm politically unreliable, and even if you let me in, you'd expect me to tow the party line. I won't do it. I shouldn't have to. And neither should Jude or anyone else. How do you know why... How do you know why Jude joined the party youth? Did he do it because he wanted to or because he had to? I don't see things the way you do, Miles, Jude said. I didn't care what he said. I was just desperately trying to get under my skin, and it was starting to work. <sighs> Maya looked hurt. She didn't want to think that her boyfriend was coerced, coerced into joining the party, perhaps coerced into being with her. The dilemma of every wealthy heiress throughout time. Does he like me for me, or for my family's power and wealth? Miles, I joined the party because it's the right thing to do. You haven't been listening to me this whole time, Jude said. Maya gave a quick look of hope at Jude. Part of her that I was counting on was seeing him as savable. Oh, this is not getting any easier to drink. And rats will run amazed to get cheese if that is the only way to get some food. The rules are set up with everyone's best interest in mind, and they can be changed by the players based on their contributions. Just because you refuse to play by the rules doesn't mean they're wrong. You're just a cheater, and you aren't cheating me, or my family, or the party. You're cheating the people, the world. She was growing angrier. Good. And the party speaks for the people, right? Only players connected with the party are ever able to leave the crib and really earn, and only people who agree with the party get to join the party. Some animals are more equal than others, I responded. What? She asked. Never mind, classical reference. I waved my interjection away. You're wrong. We recruit players who will play the best. That is better for everyone. The only reason the best players are in the party is because we recruit the players with the most potential, Maya argued. The reality is that the best players are in the party because the players with potential will want to join. They self-select. The traits that make a good player are the traits that make for party membership. Bullshit, Maya. It's confirmation based. It's confirmation bias. Every elite throughout high school... Throughout history said the same thing, that they aren't excluding people. We have nothing against blacks, but they just don't like the things that allow people to be doctors. Jews don't want to join our clubs or go to our school it's anyway. Just not our sort, dear. The party would never exclude anyone based on anything like race. No, you just exclude based on loyalties to the party itself. You have to be loyal and think like everyone else. You make sure that only those you choose can escape the beginner's area. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You think you have proved that, the part, that party members are the best players because you ensure that only party members can really play? You can't have anyone prove that the system is a sham. You can't have all the Judes out there see anything else. You have to control the narrative or it will all fall apart. But if it can fall apart that easily, what is it worth? We don't. We work to make sure that the game keeps p being played well enough to keep us all alive. We aren't stopping people who could be solid players. What are you doing right now? What are you trying to do to me? I retorted. We can't afford to waste resources. Can't you see that? It's my nano. It's the people's nano, and the party has a responsibility to make sure it isn't wasted. You didn't build that nano. My father did, or at least helped, and I earned every ounce of that bottle of nano. You're just scared that your system is the corrupt lie I said it was. You need to stop me before I can prove that someone who hasn't pledged to the party can play the game. You lie. You're a liar and a cheater. The son is like the father. We sort for the best, and that is why we are the best, and the world needs us to be the best, or it all falls apart. You can never play the game as well as those the party have found and trained. There it was. I had known that she would fall into her usual liturgy. Our argument fell into the long, worn ruts I had hoped. We were close. She was angry and righteous and was doing my work for me. Prove it. Prove it how? You said that the system isn't corrupt, that those who are in the cradle can't or choose not to make it to the rest of the game. I say you keep them pinned in their grinding way, slaves for their betters. You are sure you are right about the game? I believe it's the core of my soul. It is what makes me an Eastman and a party member. We play to save the world. I heard her associates bang their chest and salute. I swear the people who live the game turn more and more into the medieval feudal uh, passages their game characters were designed around. Thank God, it makes them prone to melodramatic gestures, trial by combat, and wagers. Then I propose a wager. Let me play with the basic associate starting package. I will win my way out of the crib. 
If your own words are true, I won't be able to do it. Why should I? She said. For Jude and all those like him. Prove that the system is right. There was my hook. She didn't want to turn him in. She wanted to save him from un from my unbelieving tr clutches. Bite, little fishy, bite. Don't pretend this is about me for either of you. You're both mad, Jude interjected. Wrong fish. She stood there stuck in thought. Let me add some more bait to my hook. If I lose, I'll grind away in the beginner's area. You will do that anyway if I turn you in, as I probably should. But if I lose, I'll do more. I'll enter a slave contract under with you. All of my grinding will go to you. What is one more supporter working for the Eastmans to me? You say supporter, I say sir for slave grinding. But that is a thing. You know I have my own queer integrity. If you win, it means that you're right. It means that the game, the system, the party, all of it is necessary. I will work for you because I, Miles Boone, will know that you play to save the world. I'll know that you were right and I was wrong. You won't just beat me. You will win me, Professor Boone's son, to your cause. And there it was. What does a fanatic want more than to destroy heretics or blasphemers? They want to convert them. That's actually pretty accurate. Maya took a deep breath. Jude looked thoughtful. Gutmacher looked like a man clinging desperately to a slender branch as he hung above a, ch a chasm. I couldn't see Maya's associates, but they must have stirred, uncomfortable with how this was going, because she turned a sharp glance in their direction. Maya, he's my best friend, Jude implored. Quiet. I'm handling this. She turned back to me. So, you will enter a wager contract with me. If you lose, you will be a supporter for life to me in the beginner's area. How long should you have to leave the cradle, or should I, say, or I should say fail to do it? A year and a day. Maya barked a laugh. This was the kind of fairy tale touch party members appreciated. Agreed. Furthermore, you have to do it on your own. No help. Not from Jude. I grunted. I thought I heard a small sigh from Jude. Or maybe I wanted to hear it. This was a blow. Jude and I had always planned to play as partners, but I knew I couldn't argue against this. Agreed, I said. And if I win? What do you mean? If I win our wager. She literally couldn't conceive of the possibility and seemed to think establishing this end of the wager hardly worth her time. I could hardly enter a supporter's contract with you. And to e and to even to have it written in a wager would be too demeaning, she sniffed. How about enough nano to represent 100 years grinding in the crib, I offered. Even for her, this amount of nano was significant. She hesitated, and I pushed. What, are you worried I'll get lucky? Fine, for a century of nano, when you lose, it'll be the final proof that your father is a dangerous fool. She paused and thought for a moment. My stomach clenched. My uh, thinking wasn't good. But you mentioned luck. We cannot have luck decide this. I won't allow some fluke to allow you to avoid your fate. What do you mean? I asked. Your luck modifier will be adjusted to the lowest setting. You'll have to really earn this. She laughed. What? I thought you were the champion of individual accomplishment. You want a solo? Then you're going to solo. She nodded to gut Macher. She took his place at the controller. AI, log this contract. A wager between Maya Eastman and Miles Boone. He has one year and a day to leave the beginner's area by satisfying all necessary requirements. He cannot receive any help from Jude Sandoval. Any help or anything he achieves with such help shall not count towards such requirement. If Miles Boone is able to leave the beginner's area, I will owe him nano amounting to one century's average net contribution of a worker who never manages to leave the beginner's area. If he is unable to leave the beginner's area, he will be entered into an absolute contract of lifetime service to me or those I appoint giving me control and ownership of all his efforts. Such efforts must be at or greater than the average productivity of the beginner worker. Agreed by me, Maya Eastman. My eyes melted, that's so sad. It took me a moment to find the breath to answer. Agreed by me, Miles Boone. At first, nothing seemed to happen, and then the nano began to close over me. I could hear everything as if the nano didn't even exist. That stuff had so many counterintuitive properties. As St. Clark prophesied, Nano truly was tech advanced enough to be magic. Gutmacher cleared his throat and once again began the process of my roll-up into my permanent character. Gutmacher 845321-iota-x-ray. Here is Game Master of Record for the permanent roll-up of Miles Boone, according to all relevant local, state, and federal regulations and laws pertaining thereto, and in line with holding case Meyer v. Civilization. His voice steadied as he went through a routine task. Exemption from usual protocol authorized, guild badge not responsive, but confirmed under authority of Exemption 7843321, log the state. Oh, I think I might finish it. I'll lower his luck modifier, said Maya. 
Cut mantra 84532-iota-x-ray, lower miles boons luck modifier to two standard deviations below the norm. The GM said, with such poor luck, this was going to be hard. I'd have to outwork, outfight, outthink everyone to accomplish what they had. Damn. But I had done it before, I would do it again. Good luck, Miles, shouted Jude. There was a pause, and then Miles spoke with tightly controlled anger. Lower his luck more. What? said Gutmacher. Maya? asked Jude. You and he need to learn. When I said he wouldn't earn this with luck, I meant it. Zero out his luck modifier. I couldn't do anything. This girl's a bitch. Uh, Gutmacher must have tried. The control station buzzed. The GM repeated his, command, his commands without success. Eventually rousing the AI and the unit into a more interactive mode. A voice of one of the genus Loci, I might have butchered that, that control our lives spoke to us. Zeroing out a player's luck modifier is not recommended. Existing game parameters are not designed around such an adjustment. Shim Gutmacher does not have the authority to override. Relief flooded into me. Don't blame him. AI, use guild leader Eastman of the party override. Beta Z99743, my respondent. You're not the guild leader of the Eastman clan. On my authority as named heir to the clan, the AI, which could make trillions of computations per second, actually paused before responding. On your authority as guild heir, override accepted. Player Miles Boone has no luck. Darkness rolled over me. Man, this chick is, this, this chick is pretty ruthless. When I came to everyone but Gutmacher, when I came to everyone but Gutmacher had left, I dragged myself. Oh, sorry. This is chapter three, by the way. Uh, I dragged myself out of the pod. My basic gray clothes reappeared out of the nano sheeting off of me. I try and get back at you for all the trouble you brought to my door, but thinking about it, I don't know what I could do worse to you than slaving away from my Eastman for the rest of your life while having to make quota with no luck. You poor lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky. You can finish rolling up at your own pod. The character blank has been permanently logged. You are this character. No luck at all for the rest of your life. Somehow I made it home. Nondescript box of an apartment. Old furniture that my dad called mid-century modern. He had an obsession with, Northern, with North America in the middle of the 20th century. The original model pod took up most of the space. Every player slash citizen had the right to an updated virtual immersion pod. Most of the updated offered, excuse me, but most of the updates offered convenience in return for less and less player control and more monitoring. I'd never, I'd never have been able to save the nano I had with a newer model. I patted its scratch lid. I had a year end at this point, half a day, and then Maya would own me. My stomach seemed to have never failed. I'm sorry. My stomach seemed to have never stopped falling ever since my roll-up. I wished I could blame it on the roll-up, but I knew that this was dread. Pure and simple. I didn't even know what would happen playing with no luck modifier. I had never heard of such a thing. Would mobs not drop any loot at all? Would I be in- oh my god, that would be like the worst thing ever. Sorry. Uh, would I be unable to find any resources? I might even starve to death before the year was out and I could be enslaved. I had no idea what to expect. But I had the rest of a party associate's package. I'd have some starting gear, some skills, some ability to alter my build, and I realized something else. I doubted Maya would. I doubted Maya knew what zeroing out my luck would mean either. There was only one way to find out. I opened the pod, climbed in, and transitioned. I feel so bad for this guy. I feel so bad for him. Okay. Um, scene break. So yeah, I'm. This is uh. This had four shots in it, and I'm almost at the bottom. So I'm, I'm a, a little tipsy right now. I'd say I'm probably like about a six to ten, just to give you an idea of where I'm at. Anyway, uh, first all was darkness, then the light. I tasted blue. It's a weird thing to taste. Somehow I heard the feeling of rubbing your fingers lightly along sandpaper, the kinesthesia of diving into the game. My feet. Felt like they were standing on a roar of brassy trumpets. And then I was there. Sound was heard. Light was seen. Tastes were tasted. I looked down at my rangy body. I need to Google that word after this. I was too thin living as I had. 
but I hadn't become frail. I was solid. Reaching up, I felt the same crew cut I always maintained. A voice rang out in the darkness. Anomalous character parameters detected. Individualized attention using three additional sectors of computational... Computational. Race sources applied to Miles Boone. Hello, Miles. How has your father been? The voice moved from an androgynous and artificial voice to something warm, female, and somehow pure. I'm slurring a lot. I am sorry. Please forgive me. One more and I will be done with this. He was fine the last time I saw him. Even here I couldn't escape my father's legacy. Or especially here. Who are you? Good to hear it. You can call me Ray Sil Sylvia. I'm in charge of birthing new characters, but I usually don't bother to manifest. Out of the darkness stepped a regal woman wearing an infula. I have no idea what that is. A uh, cephabulum. I also have no idea what that is. And a pala. No idea what that is. Which, for those of us not raised by an uh, iconoclastic game designing cybernetic nanoengineering genius obsessed with mining history for his work, are a Roman style headband, veil, and cloak. Maybe I should have waited to read that before I said anything. Anyway, she was also wearing a robe which I knew my father would insist on calling a stola. There was something familiar about her particular dress and its colors, but I couldn't place it. I'm glad for the personal attention. I hope this doesn't sound rude, but can we get started? I am under something of a time constraint. Yes, a year and a day. Very Brothers Grimm. Those particular myths don't usually end well. I was never a fan. Despite myself, I asked, what kind of myths do you tend to like? I have always been partial to Greek and Roman. Those don't tend to end well for humans in them either. She sighed and pulled down on her veil, which refused to come off. No, nor the mortals either. She let go of the veil, smoothing her pallet and continued. But there are bad endings, and then there are bad endings. So, now what? While we have been chatting, I've been working on how to implement someone with no luck modifier into the game. In many ways, it is non-obvious how such a thing could be handled. No luck is qu uh, qualitatively... Qualitatively... Qualitative... Oh my god. Qualitatively... Different from a luck modifier lower down to the functional limits of the gaming system. I did it! Uh, so, you have some leeway to interpret. And you mentioned that you thought fondly of my father. I did my best to smile. Oh, and great... In <laughs> ingratiatingly. I have leeway to implement, but I must do so in such a way as to satisfy Emilius, the AI whom the party has put in, the ch in charge of the game. Emilius is king, and I must do as he wishes, she said, looking down at her clothes. She stopped and looked back up at me with silver eyes. It seems clear from the terms of the wager and analysis of the politi political situation that the Eastman clan wants you to suffer and be unable to win the wager, playing in the way the party has developed. I shall follow these guidelines exactingly. You shall certainly suffer. Oh, that sounds pleasant. What about my end of the wager? This doesn't seem right, I argued. Right, as the world goes, is only in question between equals and power. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. So you will suffer. That sounds horrible. Our first conflict inherent in the wager. Uh, Rhea Sylvia waved her hand, and a list rose shining in the air as she intoned. To be allowed out of the cradle, you must prove your ability in two of the five fundamentals of BRMMORPG. Settlement building, crafting, slash gathering, trade, problem solving, combat. At roll-up, two of these fundamentals are ostensibly chosen at random. For those with low luck, the most difficult of these tasks is chosen, based on analysis of a player's previous performance in school and other games, Rhea Sylvia continued. Party youth, however, are given two tasks which the AIs predict are best suited to their game style. Full party members are not given the beginner's quests, the beginner quests most fitting for their game strengths, but are allowed to choose which tasks they shall have to undertake. I understand that th this creates better efficiency for leaving the cradle based on gear or proprietary knowledge their clan may have to offer their players. In this case, I cannot allow you the leeway to choose anything other than the worst tasks possible, given your game style. Yet because of your basic associate's starting package, you are afforded the guild option to choose your task. Therefore, I've decided that you must accomplish all the tasks. Man, this guy is really getting fucked. Anyway. My heart dropped into my stomach. Five? I had to prove myself in all five of the fundamentals? Definitely getting fucked. The list seemed to turn into a cyclone of golden motes that lanced towards my chest. 
entered my body and disappeared. I felt as if I were swallowing something my body could not handle. I thought the effect was part of the actual game until I realized it was just my nausea over the news I had been given. Quest log update. An impersonal game narrator's voice separate from Rhea Sylvia read the words in the little blue box. My father, with his sentimental love of the past, had inflicted most of the tropes of classic MMORPGs onto the game, and so the world rose and fell with pronouncements contained in little blue boxes. I took a look at the trade quest just to make sure the terms were as set as usual. Trade quest. To each according to his needs, for each according to his abilities. In order to prove your ability to survive and contribute outside of the beginner's area, you must show an ability to take from where there is surplus and give where it is needed. Trade goods and services across the beginner's area at increased efficiency. Earn 3,000 3, trade contribution points. Uh, trade contribution points are earned for every gold acquired above the average sale price of an item. For example, 10 times iron ore is currently trading at 1 GP. If you can sell 1,000 uh, X iron ore for 105 GP or 5 GP over game average sale price, you will earn 5 TCP. If you can sell the uh, 1,000 X Iron ore for 125 GP, you receive 25 TCP. TCP is a uh, trade contribution points, by the way. Uh, the trade quest was almost impossible to solve for non-party members. You need to be able to trade in bulk quantities across zones to take advantage of local price fluctuations. I had heard of a handful of people acquiring unique items that had no previous sale price. Most people needed to buy and sell massive amounts of commodities, the gathering which and protection of which, while in transit, was nigh impossible without guild assistance. This task was just one of five. I was screwed. Rhea Sylvia? Please, no one could accomplish all the five quests. The bet is to prove that others others than those the clans choose can play better than they can. You certainly cannot accomplish this the way the party plays. I believe this makes you extremely unlucky in their eyes. Now what is next? Yes? Starting location? This dude has no luck. Of course he's unlucky. Uh, a map of the beginner's area opened. You might think that the name Beginner's Area or Cradle would mean a small area. In fact, it was the largest area in the game that players could access. Most people lived in, lived and worked in the Beginner's Area. It represented the area that humanity had managed to clear of unconstrained and rogue nano. The whole game and its purpose were humanity's attempt to survive in the face of a singularity gone horribly wrong. People apparently once thought that when the singularity came, it would lead to a material paradise on Earth. Singularity was an idea that at a certain point, different technological developments would reach critical mass and start a cascade effect where advances in one would accelerate the others and vice versa. AI would work on material science, which would increase computing capacity. Nanotech would allow advances in chemistry and bio uh, biology, which would increase understanding of how the mind works and promote more and more advanced AI. Different advancements would help integrate the human mind with technology, allowing intuitive uh, leaps forward by merging computers and humanity. People thought tech would accelerate faster and faster until it launched us out into a brave new world. They thought that most of the problems faced by humanity would be solved. We could finally accurately model economics on the, or the weather. The previous state of the art medicine would look like you would look like using leeches compared to what singularity would develop: abundance, immortality. Man could make the world a garden of Eden tailored to each of our desires. Be careful what you wish for. Isn't that how the old saw goes? I wanted to play this damned game. Look at me now. People wish for scientists to solve the world's problems. Those scientists those scientists delivered for us. We reached the singularity, sort of, but we screwed it up. The singularity let us address all the problems humanity faced, but it didn't change the fact that a lot of our problems were of our own making. Famine should have been a thing of the past even before the singularity. In fact, Mother Nature hadn't been the cause of mass starvation for a long time. Famine was almost completely the effect of political and economic choices. Strongmen used food, for, food shortages to punish and kill their tribal or political enemies and reward their friends. That should have told us that the problems of the world came as much from human nature as material circumstance. Case in point, despite a wide count in the millions, people kept trying to implement the centralized control of socialism or communism. They brought the same old promises, even though they always led to the same disasters. My father told me there had been a country called Venezuela, with the largest uh, petrochemical reserves in the world. They decided to follow a socialist leader who promised them a better tomorrow, built by taking from others, and soon enough ended up eating their pets and hoarding something called toilet paper. 
People were always willing to give ideas that had killed millions and impoverished even more another try. The appeal of making utopia on Earth was always difficult to resist. Ends and means. If you can promise utopia, well, what means are off the table if the reward is heaven on Earth? This is where the singularity was the devil's temptation. It made new utopia so damned plausible. Even reasonable people might believe that with such tools we might make the world over into utopia. But the singularity wasn't delivered into a reasonable world. The elites of the West detested their own cultures and Western civilization. They asked for more and more power to re-engineer things and control things while delivering worse and worse outcomes. They became obsessed with faddish crusades and virtue signaling. Poor countries were indulged and encouraged in a resentful belief that their problems were caused by the greedy West. Rather than understanding the natural state of man as nasty, brutish, and short unless, unless technology and order liberty are embraced, maintenance of civil society such as property rights, rule of law, and natural rights were derided as reactionary or necessary. Pretty much every institution other than government was abandoned for social media and partisan blood sport. Restraints on government eroded faster and faster as the elites and the mobs they exploited pursued even more quixotic and impossible goals. These people wanted to create utopia on Earth. The power of the gods were given to people mired in a perpetual adolescence who had long since lost any connection to the consequences of their choices. And so, when the capabilities of the singularity came to the world, rather than ushering in a burgeoning of human liberty, freedom and choices, its tools were used to implement competing police states that, the likes of which can barely be imagined. What fun is being a god if you can make people believe what you want them to? Privacy is an ideal had long if you can't make people believe what you want them to. Privacy is an ideal had long since been abandoned under the premise. If you aren't doing anything wrong, what do you have to hide? People spied on each other, trying to force each other to act and think in accordance to whatever was momentarily considered to be the necessary thing. We'd long since corrupted information and data in the name of this or that fashionable narrative. Unpleasant truths were buried. Misleading innuendo in the service of the greater good was the norm. The most frightening aspect of it all was the most was that most of the people enforcing these horrors had good intentions or at least believed they did. Why not use the power to force people to be good? All you have to do is ignore the idea that other people might have a different idea of what being good means. We thought we were gods but forgot that God himself made sure to give people free will. Most decent people retreated into ever more elaborate escapism rather than engage with society that offered only self-righteous anger. With the power of the singularity, we would all be made to care. Opting out was not a choice. It was chaos. There were competing theories on how the end of the world happened. Some said that after the U European Union had given the new caliphate access to singular singularity tech to try to buy some peace for people in the grip of a 7th century barbaric ideology, someone claiming to be the 12th Ayman unleashed the nanos in the world as a techno-jihad. Others claim that ga Gamergate, an obscure front in the North American culture wars, was a starting point when editors for a video game reviewing blog decided to literally try to kill their critics. Legend had it that after a particularly divisive Hugo Awards, sci-fi fans turning a LARPing event into a real-world ending war turned a LARPing event into a real-world ending war. Others said that Amazon and I'm sorry, I'm trying to like picture that right now. I just picture like a like LARPing and like real world, I just picture like people actually like that, like old medieval style. Anyway, others said that Amazon and Google finally weaponized their marketing wars, or that an atheist group had been working on developing the world's most powerful AI called Satan as a not so subtle middle finger to established religion and lost control of it. There were many theories about how the world fell, but after all the death and chaos, there was no way to ever truly know. However it started, different factions and countries and institutions all deployed singularity tech against each other and in defense of themselves. This was layered on top of an insanely greater mass of nano and AIs that had been set up to make life enjoyable. Unlike nukes or conventional weapons, nano tended to evolve and mutate as it struggled with competing nano. Biomass of almost any sort was exploited and repurposed into nano. What should have been a heaven became hell on earth. Intelligent nano collectives operating out of a demonic distillation of the mixed imperatives of humanity's best and worst impulses went rogue. In desperation, a group of scientists and experts worked to save what they could from the chaos. The group, including my father, Dr. Uh, Numitor H. Boom, they created the game, a giant metaphor for the nano war. Players would inhabit nano avatars and do battle with the monsters running rampant around the world. 
fighting to recover resources from the nano madness of the world, creating safe areas where nano was under human control. Not everyone had a father who can credibly claim they created the world, but he wasn't a fan of how his works turned out. How his work turned out. In his defense, he ha he and his colleagues were rushed. They had less than a week to develop the basic architecture that saved humanity from extinction. He made the game and it saved us, but the world he made for us was no Garden of Eden. Alright guys, it looks like this is the uh, the end of the sample for the day. Uh, anyway, if you like this, again, this is Beginner's Luck by Aaron J. Uh, I hope you have a good day, a good night, a good week, a good weekend, whatever time it is that you're watching this, and I will see you in the next episode.